from the JPR Steve Nelson Performance Studio. Welcome to another JPR Live Session. I'm Dave Jackson. Joining me today is singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist Lindsay Liu. She was the front woman of Lindsay Liu and the Flat Bellies and a member of a collaboration with May Erlewine and Rachel Davis, the Sweetwater Warblers. And her latest album is Queen of Time. Lindsay Liu, welcome to JPR. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Hey, it's good to have you here. I want to talk about Queen of Time uh, and what inspired uh, the themes on it, but you're on tour with a band. Tell us who's in the band and who came uh, who came with you today and who you're working with. Yeah. So we got Mimi Naja um, on mandolin and electric guitar. Got Heather Gillis on bass and Michelle Milo Pietrofita on drums. Right. And uh, this is, give us a little bit of resume. I understand uh, that... Uh, that Mimi was in, or is in, fruition. Is that right? Yes. yes. Uh, I still am. You yeah. still aren't great. So I, I borrow Mimi from fruition. Uh-huh. I borrow Michelle from Banshee Tree. Uh-huh. And I borrow uh, Heather from Wolf Twin and the greater Nashville area. So uh-huh. Heather's in, in, in Nashville. She's originally from Florida. Um, Michelle is in Denver, originally from New Jersey, uh-huh. the Northeast. And Mimi is in Atlanta from Atlanta. All right. Well, welcome all of you to JPR. How about starting off with the song? What do you guys want to play? We're going to start off with the first track on Queen of Time. Um, I for, Every time I release a record, about two-thirds of it is songs that I've written or co-written. And I always include two to four songs also that it, were written by friends of mine in the scene, in the community, mm-hmm. people who have had an influence on me. Um, and uh, just been a part of my creative process. And and um, this one just really frames the whole record so beautifully, and it was written by Maya DeVitri and Phoebe Hunt, and it's called Nothing Else Matters. Too far. 
That's Lindsay Lou with Nothing Else Matters. It's a lead-off track to uh, the new album, Queen of Time. You can find music, merchandise, and a tour schedule at lindsayloumusic.com and uh, all of that on social media platforms as well. It's just lindsayloumusic.com. Yeah, right. but I think that even if you type in lindsayloo.com, it'll it'll direct you okay. to me. So I'm easy to find. Good deal. <laughs> And you, um, so you moved to Nashville about 10 years ago and you grew up in Michigan. Your family, uh, kind of helped spur your interest in music. Is that, tell us about growing up and, and getting involved with that. Yeah. So I grew up in a musical family. My mom was one of 12 children and, um, there was various iterations of family band throughout time. You know, it started with my grandpa Buzz was a trumpet player and sang and my grandma was a, a crazy hippie, always had a, a bunch of young people around and, and uh, sang gospel songs and everything. And um, So, yeah, so I saw my mom singing with her siblings, and then I saw the younger aunts and uncles singing with my older cousins, and then I was singing with my... I, I, my Auntie Melody actually taught me how to sing harmony with my cousin Harmony, and you can't make this stuff up. You know? It's just... <laughs> Uh, so that was, that was a big influence on me. Um, even on my dad's side, my, my grandpa Pete played the accordion and he used to play accordion for me to dance. So I started honing in on, on my being a ham from a young age <laughs> for sure. And yeah. And you started writing pretty early too, right? Is that? Yeah. They had, um, the, my dad's folks had a piano in the basement and, um, I used to go down there and plunk around on it and, you know, it's like the process started very early where as soon as I knew one song, I was writing my own song based on that, okay. you know, which is, which I think what we all do as songwriters, like you learn a song, you learn tricks, you learn tools, and then you make it your own. And, you know, my earliest days were plunking on the piano and, and re like reworking Mary Had a Little Lamb and Heart and Soul and into like my own little riddles and songs. And, and as I became a teenager and got into punk rock, I started writing like, punk rock lyrics to like indigo girls sounding melodies <laughs> oh, wow I, i've always kind of thought that punk and folk are kind of hand in hand almost oh, yeah. same thing different intensity and so uh, you maybe just bridge that gap right off the get-go for me totally i think a lot of people in my generation are you know what like once i like in my high school i was i was kind of one i, I felt you know like a um I'm not outcast, but like different, you know, that I was like a punk rock folky. But then once, you know, you go to college or you find your scene, then it's like, oh, there's a bunch of people who were punk rock folkies, right. you know, <laughs> this is like a thing. There was, we were all the one in our high school and then we all found each other right. after, you know. And you knew uh, Billy Strings, uh, you guys kind of met in Michigan, is that right? And kind of run in the same circles. Kind yeah, of. totally. Yeah. And then you moved uh, to Nashville and then ended up living basically as neighbors with Billy Strings and Molly Tuttle and the... yeah uh-huh he hit me up and was like I'm I'm gonna go to I'm thinking about going to Denver or, or Nashville and I had already been living in Nashville for a year and I was like dude you gotta come to Nashville it's like all our heroes are here <laughs> you know you can be picking with Tim O'Brien in someone's living room on a Tuesday right. and it's and it's regular stuff in Nashville and and uh he was like all right well I want to put a birdie in your ear to look for listen for if anybody needs a roommate or anything I'm you know, because you're going to need a place to stay. And somebody, my next door neighbor came out of her house at 2 a.m. one day and I happened to be walking out onto my porch and she was like, hey, I just want to let you know this house can become available and if you want to keep it in the family. And I was like, all right. Yeah. Called up Bill and I was like, hey, got your house. <laughs> so it was cool. We had a little compound there for a while. Nice. I bet that was a good street to live on for some jams. Huh? Yeah. And uh, so he worked with you on the tune Nothing's Working. Tell us about that song. That's yeah, we um, we started it um, in his dining room there, and we were talking about people in our towns that where we where we grew up, who, you know, it's like they do their best. They're always trying their best, make all the right decisions, and and uh, hold their own, and do the right thing. And 
they still kind of end up with nothing to show for it because they're just stuck in a in a scene that's not really good for them or um meant for them and uh so we we wrote the first verse and then it it kind of stayed there for a while his mom called and we ended up it, you know that's like a tangent on another thing <laughs> um <laughs> but you know it sat for a couple of years and and then I was on my way to the Jeff Austin tribute in Denver and I was just feeling heavy thinking about you know the reason for the occasion and and I had found out that week that I had also lost my cousin Emily who's a few years younger than me um and we think it was probably uh an overdose situation framed as a car accident, kind of a bizarre situation, but um, just, you know, feeling, just feeling the weight of that, of those two things, and thinking about people in my life who I still got, you know, and and worry about, and, and um, put together the rest of the lyrics, basically, between those two plane rides from Canada to Denver, and then um, to the... Iron Mountain, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. And then got together with Billy um, on my front porch. And, and by the time we'd finished the, you know, me singing my lyrics to him playing through it, once through, I felt like this, you know, the song was complete now. We had a song mm-hmm. instead of just a seed of a song. And and he left my porch and I felt, and I finished two other songs that I had started before, like in the days before the pandemic hit. I was supposed to have like a month at home alone to write and then the pandemic hit and yeah. and uh, Josh came home and the world went upside down and I couldn't finish those two songs till that day. I like basically finished three songs that day and, and I felt like this record was just ready to come through me and not everything in my life was ready to fall apart the way it needed to in order for uh-huh. me to move through what I needed to move through. And yeah. So on that song in particular, and then some others on that album, I, I, I just sense a lot of uh, compassion and empathy that's coming through there that might've come from that time. And then I really, I read that you'd uh, studied medicine in college and that you decided to do that because you'd seen some people and how they were treated in the medical field. Tell us kind of about that. Cause it seems to kind of dovetail in with some of the compassion that I, hearing on this album yeah well there there's some uh mental health things in my family and and time in the psych ward and um just seeing you know how overworked the doctors are and, and how little time they're able to actually spend with the patients and just sort of the state of affairs there um it's pretty intense and and you know this was all happening from the time i was in fourth grade through high school so uh, that had a big impact on me. And, and, you know, we were talking about, you know, in eighth grade, they give you those aptitude tests. And all my life, I wanted to be a singer until I got to eighth grade. And and it seemed like the world was telling me, you know, being a singer is like, it's not really a job. Like, pick a real job and, and you can sing, but, you know, pick a real job. And so I thought, well, I love math and science. I see a, a need here. This is, what, this is the route I'm going to go. So... I went to college, got a degree in human biology and bioethics and Spanish and was pre-med. Um, but basically met the flat bellies while I was in college and found bluegrass, found basically my musical family away from home. Um, and that really put me on my path. I realized, I like remembered, it was like I woke up from the discourse that I had been subject to in those, in those days and it's like, oh yeah, I am a singer. I am a. Uh, this is this is what I am. I'm a. I'm an artist. I'm. This is my purpose here, you know. And um, you know, I was like in a ju- my junior year of college when I met them, finishing my human biology degree. And so I just like picked up another bachelor's degree in Spanish so I could stay a year longer and like delay the having to, you know, go to medical school or do the next thing, um, and just started. I made a record with them and we started touring and I was working in a lab studying evolution and plants and I was making the same almost no money touring as I was working in the lab so I just you know it was sort of a natural transition and I I've, I've been doing nothing but this ever since so well, 
it seems to be working out for you. <laughs> um, I, I, you mentioned mental health a little bit, and I just saw something you did for an organization called Backline. Yeah. Uh, tell us about Backline. So Backline is basically making resources for mental health visible for artists and musicians and destigmatizing it and um, just giving you a place to go. You know, they've got, they're putting signs up in green rooms and just letting you know if you need help, this is a place where you can reach out and they will help you find uh, therapists um, who are used to working with people in this industry and with its unique set of challenges. There's uh, support groups and, you know, yoga classes and just all sorts of resources. If, if you need to help finding a therapist, they'll, they'll set you up with one. If you need help paying for it, they'll try to help you find a grant, you know, things like this. I'll say that they're they're, uh, they're just recently raised the funding to start a like a twenty four hour help hotline, which is huge. It requires so much money and so much training um, to the volunteers. But you know, us musicians have wild hours, so the fact that you can call for help at any time is going to be just an amazing resource. And you can find out more information about that at backline dot care. So how about another song? What do you guys want to play? Yeah, well we'll play we'll play you the song that um that Nick Forrester chose for me. He he curated the What the Night Brings Jeff Austin benefit. And he everyone played Jeff Austin songs except me. He 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 asked me to play one of my own songs, which was um you know, felt I felt honored and and it also gave this song forever now to me a new meaning and a new context and you know adding my grandma's voice and her story that I added later on in the record it gave even more context for this song and um its place on the record right so what's this one this is uh this one's called on your side or parenthetically star man and actually that night I it, the, the lyrics used to be you can be the storm and the lightning in the sky and Mike Robinson was like what is that? What are you saying that you can be the star man? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the lyric and maybe even the name of the song now. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. One, two, three. You can take it easy now. You can rest your mind. We're not going anywhere. Time is on our side. You can be the star and the lightning in the sky. I will be a shelter cause I am on your side. And trouble is a pretty word wrapped around your little finger. You said it hoping I would linger just a little longer. And a fire is a coward hiding in the smoke. She came in. shelter cause I am on your side it's not gonna be how you thought it would that don't mean it won't be good you're not lost just cause you i 
not going anywhere. Time is on our side. You can be the star, man, the lightning in the sky. I will be a shelter because I am on your side. Was on your side, Starman. Lindsay Lou is my guest in a JPR live session today. Find the information at lindsaylumusic.com. So, Queen of Time came out um, with some major events in your life and some self exploration. What was uh, kind of going on at that time? You, you touched on it a little earlier. I've been saying, you know, in the pandemic, um, it seemed like almost everyone either got a puppy, had a baby got married or got divorced and I didn't get a puppy or have a baby or get married <laughs> all right uh-huh. <laughs> so I was like I called my mom in college and I was like mom I crashed the car I did one of the th- three things I crashed the car I spent last night in jail or I got my lip pierced and she was like oh you got your lip pierced <laughs> <laughs> um no I I separated from my um husband and longtime bandmate and uh and I lost my maternal grandmother who was really the only grandparent that I had from for most of my life my dad's parents died when I was really young so she was like my she was my elder she was my sort of guide and and um I felt a real special relationship with her as one of her hundred grandchildren I had a really special relationship with her and so losing her was was pretty big, and I had luckily uh, collected her entire life story over the course of um, 27 hours of phone conversations, and um, I chose a few of those to, or two of those to include on in the in the record, just to sort of include her for posterity. She she gives context to my life and to my work, and uh-huh. and uh, and it really. It really added a lot to the record. And there's a lot of her spoken word, especially in the song Love Calls. So mm-hmm. what, uh, talk about that song a little bit. Well, I, I had written that song uh, with another longtime band man of mine, P.J. George. And um, I don't know, there's there's a lot of jam space on it. And, um, you know, we had the basic track and we left a lot of that space open. And I was playing it for a couple of my girlfriends. And they were like, "Oh, we want more Lou in this in this spot," and and uh, and I thought, "Well, what version of Lou do we want?" You know, and I realized that it was the version of me that was interested in in my grandma and her life story um, as a way of, you know, knowing where I came from in order to know who I am. And and also just her her story is is so radical and righteous that, um, you know, like I said, it, it really sort of laid the foundation in a big way for my worldview and and um, the way I the way I see things and I liked uh, the first line is actually you know she's got a light that can launch a thousand ships. Mm-hmm. There's this nice sort of maternal line there because I I I woke up one day at, at my parents house in my nightgown I came downstairs and and my mom she was like Lindsay you've got a a, a face that could launch a thousand ships and I was like what is that that is like the most beautiful thing I ever heard and um and I, I sort of amended it I I had never I didn't know that that was a like a an uh a, a, a a phrase in our in the right. popular vernacular from Joan of Arc or whatever, right. um, but I, I I claimed it I, anyway. I stole it and um, and I like to think about I like to think about my grandma and, and you know she you know she one of her stories that she would that she told me that I had heard before too is when she was in Mexico. She went to Mexico with with her three youngest children with no money in a van just to show them that you don't need wealth to survive that you know 
the world provides, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the people that she, that had sort of taken her under the wing on her journeys at, at, in one of the towns, she found herself alone with him one night and he went to make a pass at her and she didn't, he spoke Spanish and she spoke English and they didn't really speak each other's language, languages. And she just sort of put up her hand and she said, mi amor es Dios, de Dios, you know, she said, put it together as, as good as she could with her, with her Spanish, basically that, you know, that my love that you feel is, is the love of God and not, not a romantic love. Right. And, you know, she really, she, she had a very intense and extreme, uh, embodiment of spirituality. And, um, and she said it just stopped him in his tracks, you know, and, and, um, from then on, their relationship was very clear and understood. And, and, you know, she, I, I didn't know that in the tarot deck, the queen of swords is referred to as the queen of time. Um, but that describes my grandma so beautifully. Um, and, and I think of her when, when I sing that line, you know, I'm a woman in a woman's body and man, I notice you noticing, um, you know, this, this whole, just like being able to like own your power and, and with, without any sort of shying away from it or feeling shame in it or feeling any fear in it, just like totally being in your power and in your body. That was like, that was my grandma. And, and, um, just recently I've, I've looked a little more deeply into the queen of swords as, as an archetype and the queen of swords as an archetype is all about, um, just having a really beautiful and powerful hold on your communication of your needs, you know, and being, you know, not letting, not, not needing to have your feelings as understood as much as you need your needs to be understood. Obviously there's a lot of gray area there. Sometimes one leads to the other, like you need your feelings to be understood. That's one of you, that could be your need, but she was just really, she was, you know, I just never, I never met somebody so firmly, um, capable of communicating her needs and, you know, not at all. Like, I don't know. She was just almost, she was almost like stone cold. You know what I mean? Like she didn't feel anxious. She didn't feel afraid of anything literally. Yeah. She just like really so strongly believed that she had the power of the Holy Spirit on her side and, and, you know, if it was her time, it was her time. Hmm. And she just trusted everyone and loved everyone and took everyone in. You know, I, I really think of her in every one of these songs, including that last one. I think about Jeff and I think about um, my grandma and how she was a shelter hmm. for everyone. She had homeless shelters. She dumpster dove to provide for the homeless shelters. Um, you know, you can see why I was so interested in collecting her story anyway. Yeah, um, uh, so she but, sounds quite remarkable. Yeah. So she is the queen of time. She is the light that could launch a thousand ships. She is the shelter. You know, she is everywhere throughout this record. And, you know, when I told her that Josh and I were 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 parting or getting a divorce, she was like, oh, I thought that happened last November. I thought that was last fall. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> wow. it was like she was a step ahead of me already, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's a part of the record there where I was, you can hear her talking me through my having a nervous breakdown, just preparing to lose her. And I, you know, had that to her because she was, I could ask her anything. I could say anything to her. She was like a rock, you know? And, uh, and I was like, what am I going to do when you're, you know, when you're gone and I need you and I need guidance or I need to ask a question. You're the only one that can help me. And she's, you listen to the record and hear what she says. It's, it's very applicable to anyone who's ever lost anyone that they loved um so anyway she's the queen of time and that's the song we're going to play for you next okay well i i then i, I did bef i do want to hear that song you, you also um it's it's some of your discussions and some of your self-exploration you uh come up with uh come upon something you're calling the divine the divine feminine what mm -hmm. what is explain that a little bit and is your grandma kind of fit into that a little bit as well is that I didn't understand what that was, and I had this this DMT trip that set me on a course to find out. And um, 
Yeah, and it, it. I remember. I remember calling her up and telling her about my what I was learning and what I was finding out, and she was just like, "Yeah, yeah, that don't make sense. That's that's fine." You know, like she wasn't about to start calling God her and or anything. Right. <laughs> she was like, "That's cool. I think that's you know, I think that's great. I have no qualms with that." Right. You know, <laughs> I guess there's a tie there between just my understanding myself you know this this next song queen of time also is really it's it came out of the sort of alice in wonderland the dream asking your own dream asking yourself to claim who you are you know um and you know just being able to see that to see that disparity between genders you know to to see that as as a man, you've been hearing uh, the divine referred to in masculine terms. That's in our culture. That's that's what we've all been hearing. And so I think that that does sort of have an impact on your identity and your confidence and your so many different things, you know, um, not just biological, but cultural. I think that that might play. A, I think that that plays a role in, in it. And so as a woman, to sort of see that for what it is and to see that oh, I've been thinking about divinity as of something outside of myself, as something that I'm separate from, you know? That that I that I have a place in the divine was sort of like, you know, <laughs> um, it was very, it was very, it was mind-expanding on the psychedelic level, as you can uh-huh. imagine. <laughs> and probably kind of empowering in a lot of others as well. Very empowering, yeah. very empowering. And I went through all these, sort of stages of grief with that too you know start i've had a lot of frustration with it at the beginning and anger and then you know that sort of transforms like the process of grief works you know and 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 i and i read this book by simon kidd called the dance of the dissident daughter where she goes through her own journey of you know from uh traditional christianity to understanding divinity through the lands of, of femininity. Um, and I and I really connected with a lot of what she was saying, but I also sort of had to go through it on my own timeline. You know, like it took me longer to move through the phases than it did for me to read the book. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, um, that, that has also impacted my work as an artist and as a person a lot, you know? All right. Well, let's hear that song, though. Let's hear uh, uh, Queen of Time.
queen of time. Lindsay Lou is my guest in a JPR live session. That's the title track to her latest album, Queen of Time. So uh, thanks so much for being with us, Heather. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, uh, good luck on the rest of your tour. You can find out more information at lindsaylumusic.com. JPR Live Sessions are engineered by John Griffin of Luna Zen Studios. And this JPR Live Session is made possible with support from the Talent Club with cold drinks and live music in a casual atmosphere in downtown Talent. Find their live music schedule at talentclublive.com and stick around for more open air next. <laughs>